Now, I want to start by explaining what this series is about. To do that, I'm going to ask you some questions. And I want you to share your answers with the people around you. Okay, ready? Okay. Ready, yeah? Okay. So, first question. First question. Should Christians gamble? Should Christians gamble? Come. Now, I give you permission to talk during sermon. Should Christians gamble? My try umzai. Should Christians gamble? Okay, second question, second question, ah, this one. Should Christians drink alcohol? Ah, I never target anyone, ah, I never, I never. Asking a general question. Should Christians drink alcohol? Ah. Okay, last question, last question. Should Christians attend a Halloween party? Ah, HHN coming soon. Okay, Halloween horror night. Should Christians attend a Halloween party? All right, let's get her back, let's get her back. Okay, I hope you had fun discussing or debating with your neighbor. Now, when you are going through the questions, do you realize there's a common thread to them? Now, the scenarios are different, but there's a recurring theme. Essentially, the question underlying all the questions I asked is, is a Christian free? Is a Christian able to do as he or she pleases? Can a Christian choose what he or she wants to do? What do you think? Well, you'll be glad to know the Bible says without doubt that believers are free in Christ. The Apostle Paul says in the book of Galatians that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. You know, I'm going through Bible college with some of my colleagues and the module we are taking now is the Pentateuch, meaning the first five books of the Bible. As I was reading through them, I was so stunned by the 613 commandments the ancient Israelites had to observe. The laws are lengthy, tedious, and onerous. I, I really read uh, until I see stars spinning, I kid you not. Okay, I'm so thankful that Jesus' death fulfilled the law and freed us from it. Otherwise, I won't be able to eat pork belly and oysters today. Okay, but back to the questions I asked. What were your answers? And how did it compare with your neighbours? Even though Christians are free, my guess is many of you answered, it depends. Why? Because we know that many things in life are not black or white. There are some things the Bible is very clear about. We don't need to argue if killing, cheating, or stealing is wrong. However, there are areas where the Bible does not give clear cut guidelines in these situations. Should we exercise our freedom to do whatever we want? Or should we not? To free or not to free? That is the question I will try to answer through this series. Perhaps some of you are thinking it would be much easier if God spells out what we can or cannot do in every situation. But the truth is, we wouldn't like to be controlled or told what to do. So instead of giving us another 600 instructions, God gives us principles and guidelines. And I summarize them into the three sermons. Is it good for me, good for others, and good for the cause? The goal at the end of this series is to help you understand your freedom in Christ and maximize your enjoyment of it. If you're a non-Christian, you may be wondering how any of this might be relevant for you. Before I stepped into Brighton for the first time, my neighbour had been inviting me for at least a year. Honestly, at that point, I felt drawn to Christianity. However, I hesitated for a long time because I knew that if I came to church, I would most likely receive Christ, which is a good thing, isn't it? But no, I wasn't ready to give up on my non-Christian lifestyle and habits and fear that becoming a Christian would be a huge restriction on my freedom. And perhaps you are like me. You have been exploring Christianity for a while, but don't dare to take the next step because you are daunted by the requirements. I hope to share with you the amazing paradox of the Christian freedom that even though believers have been set free from sin and the need to earn our salvation, we willingly choose to give up some degree of our freedom. This may seem restrictive, but it actually leads to greater fulfillment. 
In fact, this question of whether and how to exercise our freedom is relevant for both Christians and non-Christians because it addresses the dilemma of choosing between our rights and our duties to others. If we exercise our freedom without restraint and do just anything we want, two things will happen. Number one, we will harm ourselves. Number two, the exercise of our freedom will conflict with the exercise of someone else's freedom. We all know that we can't just do whatever we want without consequences, and so true freedom is a balance between our individual desires and our responsibility towards community and society. So, what is the question? Are you with me? What is the question? That's right. I want to answer that by taking us through the book of 1 Corinthians these three weeks. Uh, what makes it a suitable book to study for this series is that the ancient city of Corinth was very much like a modern-day cosmopolitan city. It was a prosperous city made up of people from various parts of the world, of different religious and cultural backgrounds, and they brought these influences over into their newfound Christian faith resulting in diverse interpretations and applications of the teachings and law. Now, this led to some troubling behaviour and attitudes that came to Paul's attention. So he wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians to address them. Today we'll start by looking at chapter 6, where Paul was responding to a report of sexual immorality happening among the believers. First shelf, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By His power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and He will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ Himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? But it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality or are the sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. The issue that Paul was addressing here is this. Are Christians free to visit prostitutes? It may surprise many of you why Paul even had to answer this question. I want to emphasize the issue here is not adultery. Right? If, you are, if, if you are married and you visit prostitutes, that is clearly wrong, that's adultery. But how about unmarried Christians? Are unmarried Christians free to visit prostitutes? How many of you think it's okay? How many of you think it's not? Why not? Well, the Corinthian Christians clearly thought that they were free to do so without contradicting Christian beliefs. In his response, Paul not only disagrees with them, but he also dealt with how we ought to manage our freedom, even if we think we are doing something which we think is not wrong. And the first principle he offers is to ask ourselves, will it be good for me? You may be thinking, oh, that's such a simple concept, I can answer it easily. I know better than anyone else what's good for me. However, here is where we often confuse what feels good for me with what's really good for me. And sometimes, they don't go together. How can we evaluate what's really good for me? From Paul's writing, we can unpack this principle into three points that will be useful when we are contemplating to free or not to free. And the first is, will it benefit me? Will it benefit me? In, during the 1960s, there was a social movement in the West that radically shifted cultural attitudes. It was the sexual revolution, which challenged traditional norms and embraced a more liberated view of sexual expression. So this period saw a rise of countercultural movements, rejection of conventional values, people increasingly embracing premarital sex, casual sexual encounters, and open relationships. This revolution led to the normalization of pornography, public nudity, and even partner swapping. A prominent product of the revolution is 
Playboy, a groundbreaking and controversial magazine known for its nude and erotic photography and promotion of the Playboy lifestyle. He played a major role in shaping modern attitudes to its, to, uh, towards sex. The founder himself promoted a lifestyle of sexual freedom and hedonism, having dated as many as seven women concurrently. His famous Playboy Mansion hosted parties that embodied the permissive attitudes of the time. And when we go back in time to slightly less than 2,000 years ago, something similar was happening in Corinth. When Paul wrote this letter, sexual immorality was widespread and accepted as part of everyday lives. People, including believers, were engaging in sexual relations outside the boundaries of God's design, such as fornication, and that means sexual intercourse between people not married to each other, uh, such as adultery, and in particular, prostitution. In fact, Corinth became so morally corrupt that the Greek verb to Corinthianize meant to practice sexual immorality. Now, there are striking similarities between both periods. Firstly, the surrounding culture influenced believers. In Corinth, Christians were seduced by the city's permissive practices, just as many believers in the 60s were pressured to adapt to the changing sexual norms. Secondly, both the Corinthian society and the sexual revolution emphasized personal freedom and autonomy. Some of you may remember that the most popular phrase of the 60s was free love. And likewise, Corinthian believers endorsed the cultural view that they could do whatever they want with their bodies. The men in the Corinthian Christian community were going to prostitutes and arguing that they had every right to do so. Let's read verse 12 again. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. Now, you notice the quotation marks? Okay, this was what the Corinthian believers were saying to justify their behavior. You see, before Jesus died on a cross, God's people lived under a detailed system of laws, which were the 613 commandments that serve as a moral compass for their lives. Do you think the Jews who lived under the law felt free or not free? Okay, obviously, not free. The law could not produce true freedom, but it helped to define sin and show the need for a saviour. Jesus came as the saviour. Jesus endured the penalty that humans deserved for failing to uphold the law. His death is the final and ultimate sacrifice, fulfilling the requirements of the sacrificial system. Jesus lived a life of perfect obedience to God's moral law in both action and heart. He completely fulfilled the law. Therefore, in Christ, believers are free. Free from the law, from the penalty of sin, and from the power of sin. So, now, the Corinthians thought that since they were not bound by the law like the Jews, they could do as they pleased, without consequences. They equated their freedom in Christ as a license to indulge in any behaviour. What they said reminds me of what St. Augustine famously said. Love God, and, have you heard that before? Love God and do as you please. What he meant was that true love for God will naturally lead to the right behaviour. Sadly, there are people who misinterpret what he said um, to mean that you know, as long as they can claim to love God, they can engage in any behaviour, regardless of whether it aligns with biblical teaching or Christian moral standards. In response to the Corinthians catchphrase, Paul says, but not everything is Beneficial. Beneficial here translates as helpful, useful, profitable, or expedient in other versions of the Bible. Listen to this. Just because something is allowed or permissible doesn't mean it is beneficial. Some actions, while not explicitly sinful, explicitly sinful may still be harmful, unwise, or unproductive. Paul emphasizes that we should use our freedom in a way that builds us up by seeking what is good. For example, eating certain foods might be permissible, but if it harms your health, it's not helpful. Likewise, some freedom, like engaging in casual sexual relationships, while permissible in the culture, is destructive, personally and relationally. You see, the way we usually think uh, and make decisions is this. Um, this, uh, this, this, this show is not bad, 
This music is not harmful. This activity is not detrimental. But Paul goes one step further by asking, will it add to you? Will it be to your advantage? Don't merely go with the flow or accept what is not bad, but deliberately choose that which will be positive. And if you are a Christian, consider one more thing. Will it benefit you spiritually? Will whatever you are deliberating to do cause you to grow in your faith or will it stunt your growth? After my neighbor's year-long pestering, I finally came to church and accepted Jesus when I was 16, a few months after my ex-boyfriend ended things with me in a nasty way. Fortunately, my newfound faith was helping me to heal and move on. I had given up on my ex, or so I thought. Because a few months later, he came to me and asked to get back together. Now, instead of logically rejecting that idea, I entertained it. Even though I knew the youth group had an unspoken rule for teenagers not to date, and I was told that Christians should not date unbelievers, I found myself justifying my desires. See, firstly, it would be sweet revenge, because my close friend and ex had gotten together after he broke up with me. Okay, but that was me back then. I'm a changed person. Okay. <laughs> Secondly, secondly, the Bible never explicitly say cannot they an unbeliever, ma? right? Don't have this exact instruction. At most, uh, I do it secretly. Then my leaders will know and I won't have to account to them. And technically, they can't stop me. So I was free to choose. But I was more focused on choosing what was allowed rather than what was helpful. Like most people, I essentially equated what feels good with what's really good for me. When faced with a situation where the Bible does not provide clear-cut commands, instead of asking, can I do this? The question should be, is this helpful to me? My life? My relationship with God? This is a question we should apply to issues like drinking, gambling, tattooing, smoking, wearing, revealing clothes. To free or not to free? To exercise our liberty or not? The better question is, will it be beneficial for me? That's the first thing we learn from Paul's reply. The second is, will I be mastered by it? We are free to do whatever we want, but we are not free from the consequences of our choices. Some things that we choose to do may end up taking control of us. Ends up, we are not free, but ruled by it. Let me give you an example. We have the freedom to drink alcohol. Christians included. Okay, most people begin drinking alcohol in social or recreational settings as a way to relax or have fun. And at this point, we usually can manage our drinking. But imagine, because I have the right to do anything, I start to drink anytime and anywhere I want. As a result, I start to crave alcohol more frequently and in larger amounts. I feel the need to drink lots of alcohol to impress my friends or be accepted by them. Or I use it to cope with my boredom, stress, unhappiness. In the course of time, I lose the ability to stop or regulate my drinking. Every alcoholic starts off by believing that this won't happen to me. I can control myself. But if I don't limit my freedom, I often end up losing it. Alcohol now detects my behavior, controls my decisions, influences my relationships and health, what started off as a choice, eventually becomes a compulsion. I end up becoming enslaved. And this, was, this is what Paul was cautioning the believers about. Continuing in verse 12, I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. This is Paul's second response to the Corinthians slogan. Now, to help you better understand what he was trying to say, let me read to you the other versions. In ESV, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. In KJV, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And finally, NLT, and even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. It would be unthinkable for us today, but slavery was a deeply entrenched practice in the New Testament world. 
People became slaves when they were captured in wars and brought to the Roman Empire as prisoners. Uh, when the person was unable to repay a debt, they or their family members could be sold into slavery. Children born to slaves automatically became slaves too. And slaves were considered property, owned by their masters, who had the authority to literally determine their life and death. Now, because of their similarities, slavery in the Bible is used to describe the spiritual reality of sin and salvation. In Romans chapter 6, verse 16, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. In this verse, Paul was using the metaphor of slavery to illustrate the truth that everyone is a slave, either to sin or to God. The choice is ours. A person who chooses to obey sin becomes enslaved to it meaning sin dictates how he lives his life. This ultimately leads to spiritual death, which is to be cut off from the life and relationship God intended for him. The worst thing is, those who are slaves to sin are unable to free themselves from it. They have no power to do so. So, Paul was warning the Corinthians against being enslaved by anything, even things that are technically allowed. Because freedom in Christ means believers are no longer controlled by their desires, addictions, or habits. We have been set free to not choose anything that can enslave us, whether it's sexual sins, substances, or greed. In fact, that's what the other part of this verse is saying. Slaves to obedience refer to those who choose to obey God and put their trust in, Christ, in what Christ has done for them on the cross. As a result, they're in a right standing with God which is the meaning of the word righteousness. We are freed from the power and penalty of sin through the cross and become a different kind of slave, slaves to Christ. The irony is that this slavery produces true freedom as it brings about joy and peace. Now let me ask everyone another question. Can Christians clap? Should Christians go clubbing? When I was 16, okay, when I was 16, and this was after I became a Christian, a trend emerged and started spreading among my friends, and it was clubbing. My friends naturally chill me. Now, make a guess. Did I join them? Yes. Hey, what like that? <laughs> Although I was only a baby Christian then, uh, something about clubbing doesn't seem to sit well with being a good Christian girl. But I reasoned, that this would just be a group of friends seeking some harmless fun in a controlled environment. And nobody in church would need to know. So I went, you are right. Lah. <laughs> okay. okay, you may be thinking uh, how we enter the club since we are not of age. Okay, well, the clubs are so smart, they organise underage parties where they uh, serve adolescents a glass of coke but charge a ridiculous entrance fee. Okay, my friends initiated me into the clubbing culture. Okay, first, I have to dress for the occasion. So they brought me to shop at Boogie Street. Now, I just follow what they were wearing, lah, and then I ended up buying skimpy clothes. Okay. And uh, on the day itself, we were gathered at someone's house to dress up together, which was part of the whole fun. Okay, but when I do it like that, a bit awkward to take public transport. Lah. So we would take a cab uh, to the club. After we enter, a few things will happen. See, underage parties are open too, but not limited to those underage. So there will be people who are older. And at a club, People don't just want to drink coke, lah, okay? People want to drink alcohol. And alcohol can be easily purchased by those older and then pass around. Okay, and then at a club, people go there and do what? Play board game, make in-depth conversations. No, people want to go down to the dance floor and that's where uh, some, 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 interactions, uh, some interactions occur. Okay, by the time we leave, it is always the wee hours. We'd be feeling hungry after a long night, so we would go for supper, then take a cab home. Now, can I be honest with you? The whole experience was so thrilling and fun. <laughs> it felt good to be with the cool gang doing some cool stuff. So I went back again and again. Now at this point, any parents here? I just want to assure you that I'm a changed person, okay? <laughs> So this continued for a while, and I started, I started to feel, hey, something's off. 
So this clubbing thing was gradually taking over my life. I was spending a lot of money to upkeep this lifestyle, buying clothes, paying the entrance fee, having supper, taking cabs with late night charge. I was spending a lot of time on it. And each time I went to these parties, it would affect my body clock. And not only did I keep this a secret from the people in church, but I did not inform my parents on what I was doing too. I was even seeking meaning and identity through it. This curiosity to clap and the fear of missing out was detecting how I made decisions. At the start, I was confident that I was going there to check it out. Little did I know I would end up being under its influence. Can Christians clap? Can Christians clap? Can. Can Christians drink? Can. The question is, will you be mastered by it? Will it cost you to be free or not free? Most of us uh, think that we would never land ourselves in my situation. Uh. The truth is, I think we tend to overestimate our power of self-control and underestimate the power of sin. We think we know our limits and boundaries and we are sure we can manage our impulses. But herein lies the danger. That's why Paul warns against being enslaved by anything. Believers who have been set free should not return to being slaves to sin again. If you are mastered by a desire, an action, a behavior or a person, then you are enslaved. And if you are enslaved, you are not truly free. Whether you are a Christian or not, there's a timeless and universal principle in what Paul said. Often when we have to deliberate whether to exercise our freedom or not, it involves choices that could lead to harmful habits or addictions. Otherwise, we wouldn't struggle with it. In such situations, evaluate whether your choice could become something that controls you rather than something you control. Ask yourself, will it benefit me? And secondly, will I be mastered by it? Finally, ask this, will I be true to myself? It's popular these days to say, be true to yourself, meaning you live and act according to your own values, desires and identity rather than conforming to external pressure and societal expectations. This idea became popular as part of a broader cultural shift towards individualism and self-expression. So, in exercising our freedom, we also want to ask, will I be true to myself? The other reason the Corinthians argued for their right to do anything is because of the way they viewed the relationship between the body and the spirit. You see, the, the Corinthians were heavily influenced by Greek thinking, which regarded the body as inferior or even corrupt, while the spirit is viewed as something higher and purer. They conclude that what is done with the body didn't matter, as long as the spirit was safe. And they justified in indulging in behaviours such as sexual immorality, including prostitution. Verse 13, you say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. Now, now you see the quotation marks. You know what it means, right? Okay, Paul well, quotes the Corinthians again, who was saying that food is meant for the stomach and vice versa. They both are just temporary. So put it another way, their argument was for sex was this. Um, uh, that sex is just for the body. And the body is just for sex. Ma? All bodily functions are the same and irrelevant for the afterlife. So what's the problem with us going to the prostitutes? Sex and body are not important in the next life because God will destroy them both. Right? Only the spirit matters. Okay. And what was Paul's response this time? Yes, both food and the stomach are temporal and part of the physical world that will eventually pass away. The body. What does he say? The body? How? Ever. However, sickness, sickness, something is different, right? The body, however, is different. Firstly, unlike food, your body has a much higher purpose. It's not meant to be used for sinful or immoral acts. The body is for the Lord. 
It belongs to him and is meant to be used in service to him. Now, secondly, God will not destroy your body. In fact, he will raise it, perfect it, and it will last forever. Thirdly, you can never separate what you do with your body with what happens to you in the spirit. Like when a man and woman are united in sexual intercourse, it's never just a physical act, but it invariably involves their entire beings, mind, body, and spirit. So when you visit prostitutes, the spiritual part of you unites with the prostitutes too. Moreover, for those of us who are Christians, our identity of who we really are has been forever affected by a life-changing event that happened when we invited Jesus into our lives. Verse 19, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. The Corinthians came out of pagan temple worship. So Paul was using a metaphor they were familiar with. In all ancient religions, the physical temple is where the deity dwells. Now, Paul describes the Christian's body as a temple. So he's telling them, your bodies are holy because it is where the spirit of God dwells. It's a place for God's spirit to live and work. Not only that, your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. It is his residence. Think about this. If you're allowed to stay in somebody else's house, will you do whatever you please? Will you mess up the house? Will you invite anyone you wish to live in it? You wouldn't do that. And you wouldn't want anyone to do that to your house. So, by doing anything they want, are the Corinthians being consistent with their new self and true to who they are in Christ? This is a staggering idea because remember the culture they lived in values autonomy and personal freedom, much like ours. But Paul is saying that Christians have left their old sinful nature behind and been given a new nature that has been conformed to the image of Christ. So whatever you do, yes, you need to be true to yourself. And sexual immorality is not you. It's incompatible with who you have become. You will be raised from the dead. Your body is connected to Christ. Be true to who you really are. A few months ago, I received a text message from friend A to talk to friend B, whom I've not spoken to in a while. Okay, super random, but friend A straight up said this. Okay, tell me, are you free this week to meet friend B? Uh, he's dealing with a lot of inner turmoil. He feels guilty for cheating on his girlfriend. Okay, my heart sank. And I texted this friend immediately. In our long exchange of messages, he opened up about what happened. This friend of mine went on an, uh, was on an overseas holiday with his family. And, and while there, he went to the red light district, knowing what the place is. In his own words, got taken over by lust and hooked up with a sex worker. Because the experience felt so good, he went back a second time. After the second encounter, he was hit with tremendous feelings of guilt, regret and worry, because all this time, he was attached. And when he was texting me, he was alone in his holiday apartment at a loss what to do. He felt terribly lousy and rotten. He was in a state of hopelessness and despair, just dealing with the consequences of his actions. He was most concerned about his girlfriend and the possibility of contracting sexually transmitted diseases. Um, so I gave him some practical advice, but mostly attended to his emotional needs. But because he's also a Christian, backslided one, not a brighter night, okay, don't need to guess, okay, I, told him, I told him that guilt, okay, because he said he was feeling guilty, uh, that guilt comes from our conscience, which God gave us as a moral compass to guide and warn us. I wanted to hint to him that the real issue here is not that you did not stay true to your girlfriend, but you did not stay true to the purpose and identity that God gave you. That's what's really causing the confusion and dissonance deep inside. 
if you're a non-Christian listening to all this, you may be thinking that the, the command to keep sex within marriage is one of the most irrelevant and outdated prohibitions in the Bible. Why insist on this in this day and age? Actually, there is a very good reason. Because Christianity gives us a whole new understanding about our bodies. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Because Jesus Christ died to pay for your sins, life is no longer your own. Hence the question is not whether you're free to sleep around. The question is whether your body is for your own self-indulgence or for service to God and His glory. If your answer is God and His glory, then it completely changes the way we view and exercise our freedom. Whether it's sex, dating, entertainment, and the list goes on, we seek to be aligned with the new creation we are in Christ. When we do that, we experience harmony in our lives, peace in our minds, joy in our hearts. And this was what eventually kept me from getting back with my ex and put an end to my clubbing adventure. As tempting as it was to rekindle the old flame and have a special someone, something inside was telling me that it would negate my spiritual growth thus far. It would tear me down, not build me up. As fun as clubbing seemed to be, the lifestyle and values did not resonate with the new life and person I desired to be. Okay, notice that both events happened after I received Jesus as my Lord and Saviour. If I did not become a Christian, you bet I would have responded totally differently. I was still free to do whatever I wanted, even as a believer. But I was also free to choose not to do them because I'm no longer controlled by my natural desires. I now have the supernatural power to choose differently. If you're a believer, you would have experienced this. When you did the things you used to do as a non-Christian, you still get some pleasure from it. But it's not the same anymore because it also creates a dissonance in you. You feel that something is not right, that somehow you are not meant to be like this anymore. That's because you are no longer you. When you become a believer, God gives you a new heart and a new nature that finds sin repulsive and holiness attractive. So before you became a believer and you sin, you're just being true to yourself. However, after you become a believer, when you sin, you are acting against your true identity and nature. Spiritual growth is understanding why you now feel this way and consciously choosing to be true to your new self, which loves God and finds joy in pleasing Him. So brothers and sisters, I want to close by encouraging you, as we begin this series, to rethink what true freedom is and what's the best way to enjoy the freedom you have. And I submit to you that it is firstly to consider if the exercising of your freedom will be good for you. Will it be profitable to you? Will it take control of you? Will it align with who you really are? And you will be able to answer the question to free or not to free. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you and celebrate the freedom we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. And that along with this freedom, you've given us a new nature and made us a new person. But we confess that we've sometimes taken this freedom for granted, forgotten about it, used it to fulfill our own agendas instead of yours. Today, I pray you bring us back to the cross and let our hearts be melted once more by Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross so that we will find it infinitely more satisfying and attractive to live consistently with the new desires you've put in us. Grant us wisdom, especially for some of us who may be struggling with certain decisions so that we will know, Lord, how to respond and make decisions that will be best for ourselves and our spiritual growth. 
in situations or in areas where it's grey and tricky. I want to thank you, God, for giving your word to us to teach us how to live. I pray that what we've learned from the Bible today will take root in our hearts and bear good fruit in our lives. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen.